our youth participated in helping with the carnival as well as a, a lot of adults. So, yay! We give thanks for our carnival and for all of those, all those who did it, especially our preschool board and our director, Denise. Other piece of good news. What a great day we had yesterday, the day of service. We started out in the morning with 100 people here in our fellowship hall from both St. Hilary's and Faith. And besides that 100, there were about, oh, I'd say 40 other people who had already started doing the projects they were going to do. We were serving in nine different uh, areas in the city and did a couple projects here that supported those projects. And so I give thanks for all of those who participated. It was, you know, I looked around yesterday and I went and visited some of the projects and it was like, this, this is the kingdom of God. So I give thanks for that and for all who participated in the day of service. It was a great day. Okay, let's talk about the Gospel of uh, Gospel of Acts. Oh dear. Well, actually, that's not so far from the truth. As you know, Acts is the second book written by the person who wrote the Gospel of Luke, and so many scholars feel that Acts really should be considered instead of a separate book as part of the Gospel of Luke. But I wasn't I didn't even plan to say that. But that's just a little FYI. During the season of Easter, we are, excuse me, we are, we are looking at the readings from Acts. And every single Sunday we're going to have a question, the question of the day. So, today's question of the day is, can we too be converted, like Twisty was? <laughs> Whether or not Twisty appreciates being converted, we don't know. But can we too be converted by the unexpected grace of God? Can we too be converted by the unexpected grace of God? And the reason I say too is because, of course, today's story is about Saul, who we later call Paul, and his conversion. Now, what we know about Saul at the beginning of the story is rather disconcerting. We know that Saul was, was extremely intelligent, superbly educated, biblically literate, a devout Jew, and at the point of the story where we are introduced to him, he is absolutely determined to eradicate the world as he knew it, the followers of Jesus. Followers of the way. They weren't even called Christians yet. That is his goal. So we know that he was approving of the death of Stephen. You may remember Stephen was stoned to death. He was the first person who died because of his faith in Jesus. Paul approved that, he was present, and as we read today, he's on his way to Damascus, and his goal is to arrest and seek the execution of as many men and women as he can find who are followers of Jesus. As far as he's concerned, this heresy is a scourge that needs to be wiped out. Okay, now, so we've got Saul on his way to Damascus. And at this point, a theologian named N.T. Wright makes the story just a little bit more interesting. Now, whether or not N.T. Wright's theories are true, I do not know. But they're plausible. So, N.T. Wright says that at that time, people who were Jewish engaged in a form of meditation. And this particular meditation was to focus on the vision of the prophet Ezekiel. Now, the prophet Ezekiel's vision included a chariot with whirling, flaming wheels, four-faced angels, a dome, a rainbow, a throne, 
groan. And the goal was for the person doing the meditation, the goal was to focus on each of those aspects of the vision, to be able to see it in their mind's eye. So if you were, if you were meditating, you would try to see the wheels, you would try to see the, the four-faced angels. And the goal was to experience what Ezekiel had experienced which is to see the, the glory of Yahweh, which is sort of a, a couched way of saying, looking at the throne and seeing the very face of God. That's what the person meditating wanted to accomplish. And even if, if when they saw the face of God, they were knocked to the ground, that's what they want. Okay, that's the background. So Saul's on his horse. He's on his way to Damascus. He wants to, to basically to bolster his zeal so that he can go after those Christians. Of course, they weren't called Christians then, though. Those followers of Jesus. Jesus to him is the enemy. Okay, you've got that in your minds? So he starts this meditation process. And he sees the chariots with the flashing, whirling wheels. It also says in, in Scripture that the wheels had thousands of eyes in them. Isn't that an interesting detail? So he sees the, the wheels whirling with all the thousands of eyes. He sees the four-faced angels holding up the chariot. He sees the dome over it, sparkling gold, and the rainbow around it, and the colors are just as, as vivid as, I mean, he couldn't even imagine such beautiful, vivid colors. And then he sees the throne. And the throne's like a beautiful gem. And he looks closer. And it's like there's a flash of light, a blaze of light. And he looks at the throne, and the face, he sees the face. And it's the face of Jesus, of Nazareth. And he's knocked to the ground, off his horse, his face in the dirt. Now, can, can you picture it? says later in Corinthians, Paul writes, that in Jesus, in the face of Jesus, he saw the glory of God. But in that moment, his world was turned upside down. Everything he had been taught was put in turmoil. I'll read to you exactly what N.T. Wright says about it. In this moment, he was shown that the God he had been right to serve, right to study, right to seek in prayer, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, that God had done what God always said he would do but had done it in a shocking, scandalous, horrifying way. The God who had promised to come and rescue his people had done so in person, but in the person of Jesus of Nazareth. So there's Saul. He's blinded. For three days, he's physically blind. But we might say that he has seen the light. N.T. Wright says that this wasn't just a conversion. This was a tidal wave, a hurricane, a thunderstorm, all combined. That's what it was like for Paul. 
but it led to him becoming the greatest Christian missionary, the most profound, I think, Christian theologian. So now I ask you, can we too be converted by the unexpected grace of God? Maybe we wouldn't want to be converted in the way Paul was, although I don't know. I think maybe seeing the face of Jesus in that kind of vision might bolster one's faith. It also might give someone a heart attack. <laughs> <laughs> Can we too be converted by the unexpected grace of God? Now when I talk about conversion, I'm not just talking about being converted from non-believing to believing, as was the case for Paul. Although that's certainly an important first step. But I'm talking for us about being converted in terms of the way that we follow Jesus. The way that we live out our faith. So, for example, Perhaps there needs to be a conversion in the way we live, the way we act, what we do. Because the way that we act, the things that we do, what we say, limits our ability to impact the world with the love of Jesus. Or maybe there needs to be a conversion in our expectations because perhaps we tend to have a negative opinion or expectations of people and situations. Or on the other hand, maybe we have unrealistic dreams. And in either case, they limit our ability to, to impact the world with the love of Jesus. Or maybe we need a conversion of attitude because what we think and what we feel comes out of us in ways that limit our being able to touch the world with the love of Jesus. Do any of those types of conversion hit home for you? Of course, there are many others. If so, can we be converted by the unexpected grace of God? The answer is yes, we can. If we are willing. The power of the Holy Spirit is at work among us and will bring conversion into our lives Sometimes bit by bit, and sometimes in one swift action. <laughs> but we have to acknowledge our need to be converted, and we have to be willing to be converted. After all, even the Apostle Paul at <coughs> some point had to say yes. Now, it seems to us when we read the story that he wouldn't have done anything but that. But he had the opportunity to say, I'm not, you know, I must have had a, a moment of, of uh, you know, a mental lapse. <laughs> and no, I, I still hate this man, Jesus. He could have done that. And then what? Well, what I think is God would have found someone else. And Paul himself would have suffered from having not accepted the conversion, the power of the Holy Spirit that was offered to him. Because I think God always finds a way for God's work and will to be done. And we can choose whether or not we are a part of it. And so our refusing to be converted hurts us and hurts 
the people closest to us, and in some ways limits God's work in the world, but doesn't stop. So, can we too be converted by the unexpected grace of God? Yes, if we are willing, if we acknowledge there's a need for conversion, yes. The power of the Holy Spirit is at work among us. There's a missionary, Methodist missionary, named E. Stanley Jones, who says that when the first followers of Jesus were beginning their ministries and Jesus had ascended into heaven, they didn't just think of Jesus as some, you know, nice memory, some, some beautiful experience. They believed that Jesus was right there, the resurrected Lord was right there with them, day by day converting them, converting their actions for converting their attitudes, converting their expectations so that they could impact the world with the love of Jesus. And so E. Stanley Jones tells a story about how that happened to him. He was a, a young man who had led a very, um, what will we say, unhelpful life. <laughs> we'll put it that way. Or, or, or as we would say to our preschoolers, he didn't make good choices. <laughs> so, he was converted. But that's not the conversion that he tells about in his story. He felt called to ministry. And he was determined, he was absolutely convinced that he was called to be God's attorney, God's lawyer, the one who was going to defend and speak up for God. And that's how he viewed what his ministry would be. That he was God's defender. Well, he told his pastor that he felt called to ministry, and his pastor gave him the opportunity to preach. Now, I'm not sure when in the process this was, you know, if he had had any education, or if it was before he had had any education, but he had the opportunity to preach. So he prepared and prepared and prepared for the sermon. He was going to be God's defender. <clears throat> and so he got up in the pulpit that day. He'd even, you know, whoever heard of this, he'd even memorized it. And he got up in the pulpit that day, and he started to preach, and he was, you know, on a, up there on a high note, you know, kind of, you know, using a lot of language that was unfamiliar. And he actually used a word and he doesn't say what it was, that he had never used in his life. You know, one of those really theological, you know, like, uh, I wish I could think of one right now. One of those really theological words. And he had never used the word in his life. No one in his congregation probably had ever heard it before or used it. And he was, you know, preaching up there. And he looks out, he speaks this word, and he sees this college-age girl and he doesn't say he had a crush on her or anything, but I imagine that, who put her head down and started to laugh when he used that particular word. And it so upset him that he just totally forgot his sermon. So he's standing up there, and he's hoping it will come back to him, you know, sweating underneath his suit, no doubt. I don't know if he did what our seminary professor taught us to do. Our seminary professor said if, you know, if in the midst of your sermon you forget it, you just go, like you would in a conversation, oh, excuse me, I've lost my train of thought. Let me see if I make it back. I don't know if he tried that. But if he did, it didn't work. Nothing. Zip. Zero. Nothing. So he says, my friends, I'm sorry. I have forgotten. Can you? <laughs> <laughs> so I think about it. So he, he stops to he, he you know walks down the pulpit steps and he's starting down and you know totally dejected, totally embarrassed, and he hears what he calls the voice with capital V, and the voice says, "Have I ever done anything for you?" 
And, you know, he answered his mind, well, yes, yes, Lord, you've done everything for me. And the voice says, well, why don't you tell them about that? <laughs> <laughs> so he comes down off the pulpit and he stands in front of the people and he tells them about how God had changed his life. And when he gets to the end of it, he says, Evidently, I cannot preach. He said, but I love God. And I want to serve Him. And that's when he was converted. Probably for a second time. Probably not for the last time in his life. He was converted from believing that he would be the defender of Jesus to realizing that he would be the witness of for Jesus. Now that's quite a conversion. It happened in a very swift and, in my opinion, painful way. <laughs> and we might be inclined to say, well, I don't have anything to do, anything, you know, to connect with E. Stanley Jones. But that's not true. Because we all have known what it is like to fail in terms of living in the way that either we want for ourselves or we know that God wants for us. And we are always given second chances. So, if it can happen for Peter and the other disciples, for Saul, for East Stanley Jones, then the answer to the question of the day is yes. We can be converted by the unexpected.